Today we're going to be talking about how hyperledger fabric and SimChain work together uh, in this particular case. Today I'm going to be talking about hyperledger fabric. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Simba blocks of what we do as our product blocks, um, what products we work with, uh, projects we work with with hyperledger fabric, and what we intend to do for the next upcoming future with hyperledger fabric. Um, so we'll talk about who Simba Chain is today, what we do, uh, blocks our platform, and how we work with Hyperledger Fabric and how it's implemented there. Uh, a Hyperledger case study of, all, of, of the work that we've done with Hyperledger Fabric and the customers that we work with, and then what the Web3 future would be like with blocks and Hyperledger Fabric. So let's talk about the origins of Simba Chain. Uh, Simba Chain started in uh, a DARPA grant in 2017. So a lot of the work that we've done have been around in the government and large enterprise space but primarily focused on uh, private and public blockchains. So the first one that we started off with was Hyperledger Fabric uh, back in 2017. Um, and then once kind of that started kicking off around 2018, 2019, we really started to get some traction with Boeing, uh, with Nav Air, and some of the other projects that I'll be talking about today. But then we decided that we want to go into the more enterprise space. And that's actually where my background comes in from. Uh, I come from Accenture and Salesforce, where my job was to really commercialize the engine that we created. Uh, and make it to where it's more of a SaaS offering or a platform as a uh, service offering uh, built in out of the box that's functionality. That's where we launched Blocks in 2022. And so now with Simba Blocks coming out in 2022, this is pretty much built uh, as a platform on which enterprises can leverage transformative capabilities to Web3, right? We want to allow them to be able to seamlessly, with whatever their Web2 mechanisms are, whether whatever cloud, omni-channel, whatever they're presently focused on, we want them to be able to build that and bridge that within Web2 to Web3. And so we really focused on future-proofing our solution, right? We realized really quickly right away that the majority of our customers kind of go through this maturity model of being able to identify a use case, build that POC, the problems that they face within the POC build phase, comparatively to the problems that they face within the test or scalability phase were different. And so our modules that we built within our product were built for each specific phase and each specific uh, journey within that maturity journey that they had. And so here you can see this is our platform block really broken out into individual core. Our whole entire purpose is to abstract the infrastructure layer. So that be public chains, private chains, it doesn't matter. We can bring your own or present it out of the box for you. Cloud services, whether it be any of the three cloud providers or even IPFS, you can bring that to your storage services. Wallets, for example, bring your own or you can provide, utilize our out of the box solution for custodial, non-custodial wallets you like it. But really it's the whole purpose of being able to abstract the infrastructure layer, right? whether it be identities, wallets, cloud services, and blockchain. And so our developer toolkit is really built around the platform block, where we provide interoperability, whether it be a public or a private chain, it doesn't matter. Our off built in for enterprise security and scalability, smart contract designer for quick development and design deployment of tooling, whether it be chain code or actual smart contract code via EDM, it doesn't matter. Both of them are applicable. So right once, deploy to all type of mentality is kind of what we've done with this. And so I'll talk about a little bit more on our benefits of the whole entire platform, right? Dynamic APIs is really the initial phase, is to quickly get started, whether it be a, a mobile app, a web app, a postman, it doesn't matter. Really, you wanna be able to spin up, design the smart contract as quickly as possible. High availability, so regardless of TPS and transport, we'd be able to provide that as well. Full chain freedom, so that it's two public chains, two private chains out of the box, and then we also have other additional chains along with the Hyperledger Foundation, uh, we have some of their ecosystem uh, projects as well. Most of our focus has been around developer accelerated tooling. So development is, developers are our primary users, whether it be enterprise or cross-functional development most importantly. Structured data is kind of the key approach there where we allow really uh, developers and enterprises to be able to query across multiple chains with one query and one endpoint using GraphQL or graph-like tools. And then we're enterprise ready, right? We're compliant, we work with the Department of Defense, our largest customer, so therefore we do have the credibility and capability to provide that support and compliance security. And kind of the business benefits that we follow, right? It's, it's they don't have the blockchain resources, so we provide auto dynamic APIs. Uh, the blockchain can't be decided which one to choose. Sometimes they customers and enterprises feel uncomfortable diving into one particular chain, whether it be Hyperledger Fabric or a public like Ethereum, for example. How can you have an interoperability solution? This is how you would provide that. 
um, can't test or really iterate quick enough or be able to accelerate features out to the part uh, to their customers uh, once again private or public it doesn't matter our rapid development is built around that right and concerns about unreliable blockchain well we kind of abstract that right we make it easy for for our developers to be able to be a hybrid solution whether it be a public or private model and really extend the functionalities of hyperledger and its ecosystem along with the public chains that exist today so we really kind of provide a lot of advantages across Hyperledger and all the other chains that exist today, kind of abstracting the entire infrastructure layer to, to say the word. And well, what do we sell and who do we sell to, right? And that's kind of our product at the core, right? Blocks. That's that's really what kind of allows you to be able to have future proofing into whether it be a private chain or a public chain or kind of a hybrid solution model, which we've now come across a B2B2C, right? So let's say you have a supply chain, you have parts and product, but then you want to bring that to your consumers on a public chain network, right? So how do you kind of still manage to cross that data interoperable? And that's how we would do that with the core of our product. We have a platform, just the, pro just the platform itself, which is a product, but then we also have a tech enablement team, which is the services team layered on top that really provides a full implementation. Our customers for those are the three sales direct motion. We have a direct tech integrator and a system integrator motion. So therefore, enterprises that we have that can be a full product play, that can create our product, utilizing all the benefits that come out of that, so therefore they're abstracted. We can utilize Hyperledger or a hybrid solution in this case. Uh, as System SI is built on top of our platform, utilizing our platform for their end customers and consumers as well, which then they can sell to those enterprises as well. Then we also have technical integrator partners like Alithion and Fujitsu, who provide a layering integrated and embedded with us as well. So now we have a go-to market together that is utilizing Hyperledger and Hyperledger Cacti, for example, with Fujitsu, being able to provide interoperability there. And then the largest customer that we have is our government, which is Department of Defense. Uh, they provide us all the, uh, really, the, the, the complexity and all of the structure of the data, and then we kind of build that services on top of our own platform as well. So on the left-hand side, it's more of a services uh, approach to it, and on the right-hand side, it's a full product play where customers can really get started with our product today. And so now that you kind of understand how Blocks is built, let's talk about how Hyperledger Fabric plays in specifically with the products that with the projects that we've done. And so um, what we do with the Blocks platform, it's really designed to make it abstracted to where you don't have to worry about the oncology, the network, the topology, any of the above. We really abstract the entire infrastructure so you can focus on the application development that needs to happen. And that's really, really at the core of it, right? So the product that we, the project that we built was the Bipar product, which was connecting OEMs with the Department of Defense. The two contributor and stakeholders that we had, which was Boeing and Navair, and so our entire goal here was to register and track components in an immutable way, in a non mutable way, tracking Boeing production schedule for F-18 wings and tail hooks. So those wings and tail hooks have a bunch of different parts, like screws and parts and nuts and bolts that they get from nth degree of suppliers. How do we track that across multiple chains, whether it be private or public, and how do we have immutability across all of that, the transparency of that data, right? So we use Hyperledger Fabric as the blockchain to provide automated shared progress updates for each of the individual parts, so therefore the larger consortium owners could see where that product was in the assembly line or the shipping line in this case scenario. And so let's talk about that. The overall goal was to track parts that were coming in from OEMs and track the progress of those individual parts. For example, the OEM, in this case Boeing, might be able to make a wing for an F-18. So Boeing uses their internal insights, ERP systems and all of the above legacy systems that they have. They want to share the progress of that, but they don't want to expose all the data. So how do they work with their suppliers and that PO information that they have in their ERP systems and X, Y, and Z systems for the wings, utilizing that? So they bring that onto Hyperledger Fabric, where then that allows them to be able to share private permission data to the other uh, providers, in this case, the OEMs that they have additionally across. So now Navair can receive these updates using Hyperledger Fabric and really gain more fine-grained view in the entire end-to-end -end process. So they can see that this supplier is providing this particular screw and there may be a delay, there may be a possibility that that order may have some hiccups or even a recall, for example, can all be tracked. And now with the combination of predictive analytics and AI, you're able to actually stimulate exactly how that uh, process will look and feel. Now you're able to really forecast all of that information, right? And so now parts are tracked that the tracking that we are are tail hooks and wings specifically for the F-18 aircraft. 
And so here was a, the blockchain architecture where we had multiple chains really working together. Navair was on Quorum and they had their specific sunken cost that they had to operate and manage with Quorum. But then Boeing was on Hyperledger Fabric along with Tamco, another processing manufacturer. So how do we work with Quorum and Hyperledger Fabric? We need them to be able to interoperate with each other. So there are two parts to the system, the OEM blockchain and then the Navair blockchain each which will host their own smart contracts and have to work with each other so therefore the re data reflects across both chains as well and needed on one particular chain which is hyperledger fabric in this case scenario so you can see Boeing has their legacy systems that they have to work with, which is their ERP, MES, uh, all their purchasing order systems, all of the above. We placed our instance within their organization, within their intent as well, so therefore they could upload that data onto the blockchain ledger that they wanted to choose up, which in this case was Hyperledger Fabric. Now, you can see that they had to go through multiple steps. There was an ATL process, there was a lot of configuration, a lot of ma manual massaging and aggregation, right? And in the same way in, you would have to expect that that would also be the same way you have to extract that data. Manually massage multiple blockchains, uh, aggregate it, manually consolidation, and then finally really get to the data. Well, that's where we come in. We kind of provide a full abstracted level to where you can utilize one endpoint and one query across all chains. So Navair didn't have to worry about if it was on Quorum, if it was on Hyperledger Fabric, or if it was on Ethereum, a public network. To them, it would not matter. It would just be one API endpoint and one query that they'd be able to get all of their data back. And in the next few slides, I'll show you how that actually looks from a data perspective. So the blockchain process was pretty simple. Navair had about two nodes, Simba and Atamco on Fabric, which then Boeing has a script that queries their ERP system and extracts that information into the different parts that we are tracking. Once they've done that, they've actually periodically generated a CSV file which then gets uploaded, which is the data input onto the ledger as well. So now that you've done the ETL, it goes on via the APIs that, they, that we provided to them, they were able to even immediately upload that data to the ledger without any hesitation. And now that we're able to do that, the OEM, uh, onto the OEM chain, that is immediately available for NAV Air to be able to pull that data and use that data across all of the networks that they have as available. So therefore, they could utilize it with Quorum and Hyperledger, and that data was immediately available to them. Now, let's talk about NAV Air's view. They had multiple Quorum networks, about 10 to 20, and now th th that's what they wanted to get to. So NAV Air data is collected by NAV Air Smart Dropper application, which is built on Symbol's application, which really what it does is for data houses updated the periodically once a day. They just kind of fetch that data constantly, right? So now there are queries based off of Boeing's update to the ledger on Hyperledger Fabric, which is generating those multiple CSV files and contains information of those parts that we were specifically tracking for. So now we've got combination of happening, an ETL update here, a pull and fetch, and, and actually uploading of data from Boeing and from Navair, both the OEM and the Department of Defense working together. Once again, Navair also needs to push data up and pull data down, so therefore that data needs to be immediately available on any of the ledgers that they choose of. And that's where we come in, where it doesn't matter which ledger that they belong to, utilizing GraphQL, they'd be able to pull that data immediately across all their chains as well. So this was both of the two processes. So now, the purpose was the multi-chain matter scenario. They didn't want to be locked into one particular chain, and they didn't want to be just kind of operating just siloed, right? They wanted to work together as a team, right, and provide that data. So the support for multiple blockchain bindings using the interface and adapters was the model that we chose, and that's actually how our interoperability plays. It's based off of adapters. And so now there's no dependency on single blockchain. And along with that, there's a support for multiple blockchains per application. So therefore, I could have done the same application on Hyperledger Fabric and Quorum, write once, deploy to all. So as a developer, enterprise, or consortium owner, I can fully abstract my level of uh, uh, for blockchain of infrastructure that I'm causing and working with. And so now there's a lot of key benefits, right? We have a generic API for multiple endpoints. So I, as a developer in an enterprise company, don't have to have specific endpoints for Hyperledger Fabric versus Quorum. I can now interoperate with both of them. Um, or some of the other ones that we've mentioned here, such as Binance, Plural, RSK, Stellar, and Ethereum, and also some of the other EVM compatible ones as well that are not in the market. So graph relationships can be made from an asset or a transaction and one one chain with one on another chain as well. So therefore, if I make any changes on one chain, I don't have to manually go in and make those updates on another chain. So any transaction and auth that happens
happens on uh, uh, transactions that happen on Hyperledger Fabric will also follow through on Quorum. So therefore, when NavAir or Boeing pulls the information from the ledger, they have the latest information constantly updated on both of the ledgers in this case scenario. And then that allows you to really search across all connected chains and smart contracts. Now you have relationships built in with those smart contracts. So. What that means is we take a different approach, right? And this is very common in the Web 2.0 world where you kind of create a business operation logic, create all of it, you kind of just dump everything on chain, and then you do more of an analysis afterward. You kind of put the pieces to puzzle together later on. Well, we say let's do it before the fact. Let's put them on the smart contracts and chain code, and therefore now those relationships are actually queryable right away rather than having to build them much later on. So what that does is abstract the infrastructure layer, so now you can deploy on any chain because we're API-based, but then the Transactions can be searched using GraphQL across those chains of data contracts. And so in the next few slides, I'll show you guys how because of this because of this format, we're actually able to uh, see exactly how one query and one endpoint can be done across all the networks and chains. And the complexity that we're tracking for is parts tracking. The bill of material, BOM, right? Is, is a list of parts and assemblies that need to go together. Each assembly contains another BOM, and so on and so on. So there's relationships tied into the individual assets that have so much more weight and value than just being an asset by itself. So these complex relationships are across different suppliers and degree of suppliers really that they have to focus on in the supply chain. And so that's really the, 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 the synopsis of what we're trying to query and how we're trying to transform it. So you can see the smart contract defines relationships between the aggregated data sources and how they are recorded onto the distributed ledger. For example, in this case, we have the selected, you can see how the data is mapped from a supplier, which is captured on a pub log information, and the BOM data to the depot itself. So you can see that I have a stock item that's associated with a part, that's associated with a supply, that's associated with the supplier that we got it. So these are individual assets that now actually have relationship. So now with one query, and one endpoint, I can actually indicate all of that and see all of that, right? So you notice that I clicked on supplier, or stock item in this case scenario, that, and now I have supply as an orange, right? And what that does is now I can actually drill down into that. I can take a deeper dive into that with another double click. So you say, okay, let's add a filter to stock number ID, and I put in a, a unique identifier number for that particular stock, because that's the exact part that I want to get down to, right? So now we select that, and now I can see the first level, which is telling me just the stock item itself, which is just the individual part. But you'll notice on the bottom there, as a tag, I can actually click and double click into that data set and just find out information for that particular supplier, all within one query and one endpoint. I don't need to have multiple endpoints and queries regardless of what chain it belongs to. So now this view shows all the suppliers for this particular part that provided this particular part to me, and all the suppliers that touched it within the supply chain process as well. You can see that I'm second level nested into that data point from stock item to supplier. I can actually go third level nested as well with one endpoint and one query. So I can see the supplier that provided this supplier with that information as well, regardless of what chain and network they belong to. So now with one endpoint, one query, I can get three layers of data of information available to me. And now you can see with a, a much more granular view of how that would work with a consortium-like view where you have multiple networks and multiple chains. So in, in this case, progress tracking is on Hyperledger Fabric by Boeing, provided that data. Then inside this black line, then we have another uh, private chain, which is Quorum. And then outside that is Quorum as well. These are all providing three different layers of data. But in this case, I only query the PO details. Once I've queried the PO details, I can see what supplier belongs to, where it is in the status of the progress tracking, which nth degree of supplier provided that, and which part provided that as well. Along with that, I can actually double click and triple click into which aircraft that particular belongs to now, at the end of the supply chain process, all with one endpoint and one query. So regardless of how that is, uh, regardless of the infrastructure and how it was set up, you can actually query across multiple chains and networks. In this case, which is what we call interoperability 1.0, being able to read across multiple networks regardless of the infrastructure and network there may be. We're working on interoperability 2.0, which allows us to read and write. So for example, if the part price goes up for this particular part, the, uh, 
uh, product details and the OEM delivery price also goes up automatically due to smart contracts and chain code without having a reactive human intervention to it. And that's being able to write across multiple chains as well. So we're working on interoperability 2.0. And this is what we delivered for uh, Navair and uh, our Boeing blockchain initiative, which is being able to talk to three different environments, whether regardless of infrastructure or choice. In this case, we had Echo Ledger Fabric. In this case, we had a blockchain, enterprise blockchain service of Azure. They were using that as well, along with their uh, OEM version, which is uh, the Hyperledger Fabric. And then we also have Navair, which had their own Hyperledger Fabric version as well. So now you've created a foundation of data share and trusted distributed ledger. So the outcome was pretty simple. We seamlessly integrated Navier and Boeing systems using Simba and Hyperledger Fabric, so the two applications. And then implemented a secure access and robust data validation for enhanced system reliability. That was one of the uh, really goals that they wanted, right? We automated that data time updates and real time critical updates through smart contracts. So kind of speaking to that interoperability 2.0, we were able to create alerts. Now we want those alerts to automate, right? We want them to follow through with action as well. So when an alert happens right now, it's more of a manual intervention. We go in and do what we need to do. But we want that to be more automated to where smart contracts can pick up on that alert and notification and complete the transaction that they need to complete. Um, digitizing an optimized manual process, right? That, that was all manual. That whole entire thing with the ETL process completely automated the way we uploaded data or brought data to the chain as well, right? An expanded blockchain model by incorporating additional FRC, FRC suites and, and unified solution, kind of unified it all. But really more importantly than anything are the benefits, right? Life cycle traceability, part history, inventory levels are now available. Everything that we were looking at from a traceability that was not available from the supply chain perspective is now all available. And with those data points, now companies can make better decisions, right? Or provide a predictive analytics layer on top to make those decisions in a much better way. And so this is kind of how the infrastructure really looked, right? You have the Simba Chain API, cache data going in and out. You have NAV Air and uh, uh, with, uh, with Boeing's infrastructure involved as well, the service bus. So you have Hyperledger Fabric really built at the core of it, right? And all the Hyperledger Fabric users tied to one configuration. User and onboarding users is a, always a complex process when it, comes to, uh, when it comes to permission chains. We make that super easy by building it more out of the box for us. So therefore, customers don't really have to worry so much about how the network typology has to be and onboarding folks to your consortium is much more easier with that being said. And so what do we intend to do going forward? Well, we have Stratify, we have some integration with our technology partners, and then there's a lot of Web3 tech trends, right? With hybrid solution, with a more B2B2C-like solution. How do we incorporate that and make it easy, right? And so Blocks kind of brings all that technology together. So for Stratify, we've got a recently $30 million Department of Defense contract that we were just recently uh, awarded. And so because of that, the whole purpose of what we're doing is modeling across objectives, right? Moving digital assets across. So this is kind of what, what, what I like to call is the phase two of what I just explained is the five part, right? It's not really a phase two, but it's kind of going into that same direction of being able to now associate metadata with those individual assets that we just started tracking, but more importantly, that off-chain data, right? We were just talking about on-chain data in the previous project, right? Now this associates on-chain plus off-chain, like the PDF, so the invoices that you may have that you want to associate to that individual transaction as evidence, how you do that. That's how we would do that. And so we have more of a state machine smart contract mechanism that we like to implement with, which will allow us to see off-chain data of the digital file storage, but then also incorporate how those assets are actually authorized and used using DIDs and VCs, which I'll talk about in the next slide. And so this is kind of our infrastructure that we'll go with, is securing those digital assets, utilizing uh, the TDPs, design files, those documents that they need to be able to provide with those transactions. We're gonna utilize DIDs and PCs using the smart contracts to authorize them, right? Then we'll have supply chain data with that as well, going into the same process and flow. And so process materials, tracking, tracking more than just the F18 parts that we did in the first part, right? But then now, now that we have that data, we also wanna track the finances that behind that as well, the transactional actual data along with it. So budgetizing with that as well. So we want to put that on our assets as well. Once again, being able to provide a predictive analytics layer on top of all of that is very important. So therefore, we really abstract all of the blockchain infrastructure for a predictive analytics company to come in and just utilize the data based on their access that is allowed to them using the smart contracts as well. So they are now a part of the consortium rather than being an outside layer of the consortium providing predictive analytics. And this allows us also to be a part of a secure IL-45 environment, which is what we're aiming to do. 
And so that was more of about the stratify, the government work, but we also have the enterprise, the technical integrators and SIs that we cater to. Deloitte being one of the first ones that we're focusing, working with, which is kind of their tech trends that we're kind of working with, right? Non-public and permission networks, we want to continue to grow on Hyperledger and some of the other ones that come into the market. Improved interoperability, being that hybrid model, allowing customers to not be locked into a particular chain, or even having to worry about which chain or why. Actually just getting the benefits out of, for example, Hyperledger, being able to utilizing the benefits right away, that's what we want them to focus on. And more importantly, tech improvements and innovation such as ZKP, DIDs, VCs, this is the new identity model of the remainder of the year, that's kind of what we're all focusing on, so implementing them as well. And so, kind of the trending initiatives, projects, or the type of projects or use cases that we're working on currently or we have within our build pipeline or sales pipeline, all cater from supply chain all the way to circle economy, customer engagement is more of our B2C, supply chain is more of our B2B, track and trace, authentication, uh, 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 providence, inventory. Uh, NFDs is a new one that we're working with as well, which is non-fungible documents, right? This is more like titles, credentials, uh, liquor licenses, marriage licenses. They all have municipals, right, that need to go through a certain life cycle of the asset, right? That may have multi-party systems, a uh, soul-bound system, for example, like that. So those are the kind of things that we do. Um, uh, sustainability, e ESG is a huge one, right? Carbon tracking, being able to input that information, kind of output that information as well. Uh, and then some of the other ones that we're not kind of focusing on is economy of things or implementing more with the AI data providence as well, being able to provide more onto that side as well. So these are kind of the initiatives. Uh, uh, recently we worked with Olytheon, a partner of ours, to make physical NFTs. So what that means is actually they're able to take an image of any particular item. Uh, right now, glass is the only thing that's a variable and specific types of glasses, but any other item, whether it be this particular item here, my jacket, my shirt, or an expensive handbag, for example, you could take that picture using an iPhone and that immediately registers it as an NFT. Now, once again, if I want to validate or see if that item is a counterfeit, I would scan using the Olytheon app the same image or any angle of that actual handbag, for example, and it'd be able to immediately identify Identify if this is a counterfeit product or not and then you'd be able to track that using the NFT so Therefore it's created as an NFT and this could be uh, really just a simple non fungible token um, ERC721 using Ethereum or you can, uh, a chain code for example and you can utilize the same exact thing So this architecture reference is built for any type of uh, infrastructure or chain that we have to us whether it be public or private um, and this would allow you to actually check the image fingerprint with the NFT and if it's authentic, it releases a lock which is pending and then we can transfer it. If it is a fake item, it will actually reject, it is not authentic, so therefore it will cancel the request. That is technical integration partnership at its finest. So that is with Elytheon, who we partner on top with, providing really the infrastructure, the smart contract, everything on the blockchain side, while they focus more on the counterfeiting side. And so this is the five steps, right? The supplier uses an app to photograph the item. It is requests the ascent to Simba's platform to be an NFT that's minted. And the request contains a name, description, hash code, and then the off-chain file as well. So the image itself can be stored in an off-chain uh, storage, whether it be a blob storage or whatnot. And then it creates a hash with an on-chain. So therefore now the, associ uh, the associated off-chain files are now uh, stored via a hash on chain as well. And so now you can check if the item is authentic using the solution queries that Simba Chain provides. And then if they are, we've completed the check, you can actually transfer, burn, uh, move over, sell, all of the above now that you've authenticated the actual part itself. And so that really kind of provides an authentication and verification. This is something that we've done on a public chain. We've also done this in a POC level or a, a sandbox environment in uh, on, on a per, uh, per, uh, permission chain like, for example, Hyperledger and Fabric and Forum. Them, and we intend to roll this out as a go-to market solution uh, with all of our customers, regardless of what chain of choice so they need, private or public, and be available for both. And that's really us in a nutshell. That's uh, Simba Chain and all the work that we've done with Hyperledger Fabric and all the things that we're going to be doing in the upcoming future. Thank you.